guys, DM here, and today we are talking about how I was able to manage a $30,000 a month rental portfolio all by myself using certain softwares and technologies and strategies so that I don't have to pay up the 20 to 25% management fees. That is crazy. That is the income that my husband and I live off of. So I would never give that away at this age and at this time in our life. We can work a little bit to have a lot of free time. So in this video, I'm going to share with you some of those strategies. Let's go. All right, guys, when it comes to managing your own rentals in terms of furnished rentals, there are five factors to consider, things that you have to manage. The first thing is the home itself, then you've got the listing, then you've got the renters, uh, and then you've got the turnover process, and then you've got the finance aspect. And every good business and every good business owner, finances are very important because they help you make decisions on what you can do next and what you need to fix right now. So let's roll into the home. Okay, so for the home, you've got routine maintenance like pool service, uh, landscaping, gutter cleaning, things that need to happen on a regular basis. I hire all of those services out. I actually don't do any of those myself, but I have some properties out of state, so I just go ahead and outsource that. How do I find these uh, workers? So I use services like Thumbtack uh, to connect me with local workers. If I can't find anybody suitable there, I can also go into Nextdoor or um, Facebook groups that are local to the area and ask for recommendations. Another idea is you can walk your neighborhood and knock on doors if it seems like uh, somebody is getting landscaping done there, you can ask for referrals directly from your neighbors. Aside from the routine maintenance of the home, you have routine tasks that you need to take care of. This could be changing water filters, changing batteries, changing light bulbs. When it comes to these smaller tasks, and if it is in a midterm rental where you're renting 30 days or more, oftentimes you can ask your guests to help you out with some of these small chores. Maybe when the time comes up, you can reward them with like a DoorDash dinner or some grocery deliveries or a little bit off of their rent. If you have of a uh, shorter turnover and you're renting Airbnb by the night, it's unlikely that it would be reasonable to ask your guests to do some of these things for you. So you can work with your cleaning team and consider asking them to do some of these tasks for you. If that is not an option, you might consider hiring a different cleaning team who is willing to be more flexible, or you can go on TaskRabbit and just make sure that you have a uh, door keypad that you can give a one-time code to someone who can come in in between guests and take care of those small tasks for you. In the home, you also have repairs to consider. The repairs, I kind of treat the same way with the landscaping. So when repairs come up, I would use maybe Angie's List or Thumbtack to find a, a provider that can come in and do the repair for me. It's especially uh, convenient when the repairs are outside of the home because it doesn't usually interfere with the guest's stay and it doesn't require the guest to be home to let any service provider in. I often do ask midterm renters to be home for service providers if the service provider requires someone to be home. If they don't, then I can provide a door code. Short-term guests probably don't prefer to be there. And also if it is close enough to the next turnover, I'll just do it in between the next guest check out and before the next guest checks in. Okay, then you've got your long-term maintenance items, things like maybe replacing a water heater or a furnace or a wall heater or even a fridge. So for me, that one's kind of hard to juggle in terms of decision making. Do I replace the item before it completely dies out on me or do I wait for it to die out on me and then I replace the item? Um, it's hard because I am trying to keep every penny that I can and even if it's on the older side but it still works, I like to let the thing go, keep running. Here's some of the uh, things to consider. I have home warranties on all of my homes. If you let the item die out, then it's possible that the home warranty will step in during the repair process and recommend that it gets replaced and then they will 
either cover the entire cost or a majority of the cost. And when it comes to these big appliances where they are thousands of dollars, that might be worth it. However, I also have experienced doing that and then it interrupts my ability to rent the unit. For example, if it's winter time and the furnace goes out, well, you're gonna have a really hard time convincing a renter to stay reasonably without giving them a huge discount or having them vacate and losing that rent completely. So those are some things to consider. It's a case by case decision that I make, but it is something that you gotta keep in your mind. One tip that I have is when you first buy a home, of course, there's going to be inspections through the purchase process. And then when you uh, start entering the home, you're probably going to do some upgrades and changing some things before you list it on the listings. So for me, I would consider every five years just hiring someone out to come and do an inspection for you again for things like the roof and those big furnace items for plumbing. That way, if any new items have come up without your attention to them, you can address them at that time. All right, guys, now it's time to move on to the listing. And before we get into the listing, I wonder if you would consider commenting below and letting me know what are some of your biggest fears about home ownership is. I'd love to get some ideas to either create new videos for you or answer your questions. If you haven't purchased a home before, but you want to get into the real estate investing game or you want to do furnished midterm or short-term rentals, what are your biggest fears about home ownership that I can help you with? Comment down below. All right, now let's move on. So the listing itself, where are you gonna list your property? How are you going to ensure maximum occupancy based on how you list your property? Here are some tips and tricks from me. So I do list based on the duration of stay. So for example, if I'm going to list a unit for a long-term tenant, then I'm going to list it on like apartments.com, Zillow, um, even Craigslist in my area, Facebook Marketplace in my area, and I'm definitely gonna put out the word in my own local network for renting that long-term unit. Once the renters come to my attention, I ask them to fill out an application and then I do a thorough screening on them by calling their contacts, references, employers, and do a thorough screening. That's only for long-term renters. Now for midterm renters, people who are staying 30 days or more, I will list my listing on furnished finders, VRBO with a minimum of 30 days, and then Airbnb, again, checking for a minimum of 30 days in the settings. And then of course, if it's short-term renters, then I would book them or list them on uh, Airbnb again, but not have that minimum nights of 30 days. Same thing with VRBO and then also booking.com. Those are the sites that I prefer to use. There's also a lot of other options. You can even do a direct booking website if you'd like to so that people can book with you directly. I don't always recommend that because you don't know who you're going to get in, but that might be a great resource for repeat customers. So if they come and book with you for the first time and you feel like you would have given them a five star, then maybe you automatically send them an email with the link if they wanted to book in the future. And maybe you give a small discount in place of what they would have paid to the um, platforms that they're booking on as a fee. Like Airbnb and VRBO charge quite a bit to their guests for booking at your place. So that might be a good incentive for them to bypass that and book directly with you. Just keep in mind that Airbnb does have air coverage, so um, some type of insurance policy that helps you out, but I also insure all my properties on my own as well. And if they are returning guests, then at least you lower that risk. So in terms of your listing, it's really important that even though you're listing in multiple places, that you're not gonna accidentally allow a booking to occur that overlaps with another booking. Wouldn't that be a huge freaking mess? So how I prevent that is I use a third-party scheduling software that integrates all of those into one, and I use Guesty. Um, so Guesty allows you to link up your Airbnb calendar and your VRBO calendar um, so that they, like if one person books on VRBO, then it will block even on the Airbnb calendar those dates so someone on Airbnb cannot book those dates. Now, it is limited to those few, and I think even booking.com, so those three sites, um, I'll double check for sure, 
but also if you get a customer through let's say another source or you have a family friend who's coming to stay and you want to reserve the space for them how does that come up well you can enter it manually and block those dates and that will then send um, back out to those other platforms that it does connect with so that your private stay or your custom stay that you manually enter does not get overbooked by the other platforms. Guesty is also really great because it allows you to send automated messages to your renters. You just, as long as you have their phone number or contact information in there, you can automate text messages, platform messages, or emails. It's really great if you're gonna do like a pre-check-in or a thanks for booking, or here's the instructions, or here's where to park. All of these things that you wanna communicate to every guest every time, you can enter it in there. And what's extra cool is that you can do it per property so that that specific part of the message will go to that guest if it's staying at that property. But if it's another property, they get a different description. So I super, super love Guesty. Even though Guesty is amazing, it does not mean that there are no glitches. Sometimes there are glitches that occur in the system and you just have to check it every day or every few days in the morning just to make sure that all of your listings are available to book. Um, I've found that sometimes it shows that a random date is not available even though I never blocked it off so that's really important for you to stay on top of your schedule even though the system is quite automated another cool feature about Guesty is you can go into Guesty and change the price in Guesty and that will change the price in Airbnb and VRBO as well and it even gives you an option to do a upcharge percentage on the platform so for example you can say hey whatever I say at the price here shoot that to Airbnb but for VRBO upcharge that 10% it's just a different way to test the market to see if you can make more money per booking based on the platform the last and probably one of my top favorite things about Guesty is it will allow you to do automatic reviews. It has a pool of pre-generated positive reviews that are five stars that I go ahead and set up for all of my guests because by giving them a positive review or a review at all, um, it'll prompt them to remember to leave me a review. And so by automating the process, I ensure that that happens. Now, if I have a guest that I can tell that I don't want to automatically review, I go in there and I turn off that auto review. I also set that auto review to occur a few days after their booking has ended that way my cleaner can go in and has taken care of the property to ensure that everything is left intact before I dare give a five-star review all right guys now we have moved on to the next section we're gonna talk about renters now I want you to know I'm making these videos for you with a lot of thought and a lot of research and a lot of personal experience if you find it useful please consider subscribing it doesn't cost you anything it really helps me out a lot now, are you ready to talk about the renters? I know that real estate is a big investment. Furthermore, once you furnish it, it's a bigger investment. You want it to look nice. You want it to be easy to rent to the next guest. You don't want to have to reset everything every time because somebody has a sink full of dishes, has ruined your blinds, ripped your sheets, etc. right? So it is really important to have good guests, but how can you screen your guests? So this is what I do. So when it comes to short-term rental, as I mentioned, I rent on the three platforms platforms, Airbnb, VRBO, and Booking.com. A lot of those platforms you are able to see previous guests' ratings and you can determine if you want to book to them or not. Now, the caveat to that is if you want to screen each guest, that means that you have to select for manual booking, which means that you will review each inquiry. This does give you a lower chance of being seen by guests. You will not get as many bookings with this approach. So this is how I do it. I do set up instant bookings for all of my short-term rentals. That means that I can set a criteria of they need to be referable by other guests. They need to have five-star reviews on average or four and a half-star reviews on average. They must have government ID on file. Some criteria that I can already screen out and know that it is okay for me to book automatically for this guest, which means that they can just submit the booking and they're done. Now, in that case, if they don't meet the criteria, they have to then manually make a request. And the system does it all by itself. 
So if this guest doesn't meet the criteria, they have to submit a request to book and I'm able to see it and then review it. When would that occur? It may be a customer is new and they don't have any reviews yet or they don't have enough reviews yet. Then the system will send it through to me and I will make a decision based on my discussion with them through the messaging or um, our point of contact, maybe how long they're staying, assess my risk level. So based on that, I'll do that. Now, if it's for midterm renters, like if they approach me through Furnish Finders and I don't have a way to see their ratings or what they were like through previous days, then I go through the whole screening process and I use apartments.com to let them submit an application which will run a credit check, a criminal background check on them. The information there is secure because even though they have to enter in their personal information, I don't ask, get access to any um, sensitive material. I just get to see things that are relevant like their credit score if they've been evicted before and uh, criminal history. And I will also talk to them on the phone. If I feel it necessary, I will also contact their references and then make a decision from there. Plus, for midterm renters that I don't get through the online booking platforms that I'm screening myself, I actually have deposits for them, security deposits that are refundable based on how they leave the condition of the home when they vacate. Long-term renters is where I spend the most energy per person in terms of reference checking. They are the biggest risk, right? Because they are staying there for a long time, usually at least a year, and often they will renew their leases. And so I definitely do the whole thing like I just mentioned to you, um, but I'm more serious about making sure I call all the references, asking very targeted questions like, would you re-rent to this person? Did they get their um, deposit back? Um, were there any late payments and get the vibe of the person that they're talking to. I also talk to personal references and then I meet th this person in person at least twice before I commit to renting to them because the stakes are so high. All right guys, so that completes the section on renters and now we're talking about the turnover. So the turnover could be the biggest labor intensive part of your management job if you do the cleanings yourself. I do not. If you're not gonna wanna do the cleanings yourself, then that means you lose a little bit of money because you're paying someone else to do it, but your lifestyle is a lot freer. So I'm gonna talk about ways to make your job a little bit easier, okay? So we're gonna talk about the cleaning, we're gonna talk about replenishment items, replacement items, and door codes. So. In terms of the cleanings, I will schedule with my cleaner in advance. So if I know someone is checking out in advance, I'm gonna go ahead and book that date with her because, or them, I have multiple properties in multiple places. So whoever it is, I'm gonna book with them. I do this through whatever channel that is normal for them. So it could be text messaging, one company, well, my company that I own, I can book online. So I book my own cleanings online through my company for the local houses. And then the other areas, I'll text message uh, the cleaner. The early you book the better because you can ensure that those dates will be available for them always have a backup plan please so I um, have other contacts in the other areas if this cleaner can't show up for some reason I can call somebody else okay now when it comes to the cleaning it's really important for you to be clear on what you need but not overly demanding to where they don't want to work with you anymore so for me I often have a replenishment closet where I keep my extra inventory these are for my first furnished rentals, whether it be midterm or short term. And inside those replenishment closets, I have things clearly labeled. And inside the back of the door, I have the cleaning instructions and the like a checklist of things that they need to review before they leave. I also provide this instructions to them in person if they want on the first time. But a lot of times if you're using a cleaning company, it might not be the same cleaners who come back each visit. I also don't want the cleaning company to erroneously change my instructions or leave something out, especially if I can't see what they wrote down. So in those cases, I actually just tell them to instruct the cleaners that there are cleaning instructions behind the door and I don't give further instructions because I don't want them to only read what they see there and not what I've posted behind the door. That's a pro tip for you. Coming from an Airbnb owner and a house cleaning agency owner as well. Okay. 
So moving on to replenishment items. So when we replenish items, it's really important that our inventory closet is stocked of the items that we need, which means that we also need to request that our cleaners inform us when things are running low so that we can send them. If you are not near the area or you don't replenish it yourself, one pro tip for you is to use a same day delivery service and have it delivered before your cleaners get there or right when they get there if you can time it out that way. And when they get there, they can take those items and put them in your storage closet for you, especially helpful for long distance investors, okay? And then in addition to that, you've got your repair items. So if it's something minor, you might be able to work out with your cleaner, um, like light bulbs, batteries that they need to replace. Also, I have extra towels and sheets expecting that some will decay over time or get stained or ripped they just need to be tossed out so that's another idea is like if you know that that happens then the next cleaning because now you're down a set of towels or down a set of new sheets that you just used to replace you're gonna want to order that and have that for your cleaner so that they can restock the replenishment closet and if they're willing I would always ask if they can send me a photo of that closet before they leave so I know what the inventory looks like right now before the next cleaning. All right, guys, so let's talk about door codes. If you have door codes that are automated, I have um, in my link down below, actually in the link down below, I have everything that I use to furnish my furnished rentals, whether it be a midterm rental or an Airbnb. But with the door codes um, that I have, I can actually change their door code manually on my phone. I have backup door codes. I also have door codes for the cleaners. But what's extra special about working with the Guesty software and these particular locks that they work with is is that when a customer books and it is automatically populated into Guesty, it will also then generate using their last four digits of their phone number on file the new code that is only valid during their stay at that property. So highly recommend that. Now, things can go wrong, so be sure that you get an automatic lock, a smart lock that also has a manual key in case the battery dies or something happens. And then using that key, you're gonna make duplicate copies and you're gonna have two manual lock box on your properties one for if that doesn't work and they need a manual key and then another one for the same set of keys if that first set of keys gets lost so you have all these backup plans in place to ensure that if you are away on vacation like I often am halfway across the world things are still taken care of because there are backup plans in place Okay, now the juicy part. We're talking about finances. It's obviously really stressful sometimes, but so important and what you work really hard for. So let's talk about the finances. Um, first things first, rent, deposits, um, that kind of stuff. In platforms that collect the money for you, like Airbnb and VRBO and Booking.com, those are pretty straightforward. When the guest creates the booking, the money gets collected. When the booking is about to happen or a few days after, after the money gets transferred automatically into your accounts. So here is my tip for you. I have different checking accounts for each different property because when Airbnb sends money in, it just shows as Airbnb money. And if I had it all go into one checking account, I would be highly confused as to how each property is performing in terms of sales. But if I allocate the funds to be funneled into the account that belongs to that house, then I know what house is making what amount of money every month. And so that's a huge time saver in terms of bookkeeping, right? Some platforms allow you to have the option to collect deposits. I find that that could be a barrier to entry or it prohibits uh, certain people from wanting to book. So I typically don't do deposits on those platforms because a lot of times even Airbnb has AirCover, their own insurance. They also have star ratings so I can see if it's a quality guest or not. On VRBO, there is an option for that guest to pay a small fee for a huge insurance, like maybe $39 to $79 for up to millions of dollars of coverage. So I require that as a part of the booking. Um, those are really simple ways to protect yourself. Now, when you rent off of those platforms, like through, let's say, apartments.com or through Furnish Finders, and you're collecting the rent yourself, 
in that case I do collect a security deposit and it is really important for you to remember as a landlord to return the security deposit after the cleaning has been completed and you ensure that everything remains intact so I always set myself a little reminder after each of those types of bookings to remember to refund their deposit based on the condition that the home was left in paying bills there are a lot of bills the more properties you own the more properties you manage the more bills you are going to have so automate things as much as possible okay so how i do my automation is all of my bills i try to do an auto pay again specifically out of that account right because for example gas and electric here we use a company called pg and e well if all of my deductions come from my main account that says pg and e i don't know which expense to allocate this to which home right so by using the debit card or the bank account um, and doing a direct pay for just that house's energy bill then i'm able to know that any amount deducted from that house well that belongs to that specific property's energy bill okay so do a lot of those auto pays now sometimes you can't do everything automated like for example how I have it set up as you know with the multiple houses and their own checking account I have a primary checking account for all of my businesses and at the end of every week or couple of weeks I'm gonna look into those accounts and I'm gonna transfer money from those houses into the main checking account whatever that is profits and that I can afford to put in there and so that process I actually have to do manually because I'm gonna decide how much money to keep in those individual house accounts and how much to put over into the checking account I use those individual accounts to pay for the mortgage too so I generally leave in there any amount that is up to the expense limit so for example mortgage utility bills stays in that account anything that's above and beyond I transfer to the main account and that's considered my profits I always leave an extra $500 buffer just in case I messed up or forgot to calculate something then in that main account I might pay for the overall credit card bill for the month which we pay off in full but we get a lot of credit card points so we use credit cards for that um, I might pay for any travel travel expenses that is not specific to a home but is in general part of our general business operations. Lastly and very important is bookkeeping and accounting for your business. This is something that I would say like 99% of business owners do not want to do or they put it off in the back burner. I am guilty of that as well. So one of the things that I have finally caved and done is I'm outsourcing my bookkeeping. Now bookkeeping through softwares like QuickBook, which costs money, or Wave, which I highly recommend and will also link below, is free, okay? But the thing about it being free or that it costs money is that you still have to go do it. So if you're not gonna do it, then you've gotta hire someone to do it for you. The drawback about hiring someone to do your bookkeeping is they will never know 100% all of your transactions. They may be able to see visually and recognize a pattern and um, categorize maybe 80, 90% of your transactions, but you are still going to help to help them with the rest of them. Um, by that, I mean like, is this Amazon purchase for uh, which property and why? Even though I still have to help the bookkeeper that I've hired, by having them there and working with them on a regular basis, I will hold myself accountable that these books will be completed on time. Oh, where do I find my bookkeepers? I found my bookkeeper on Fiverr. You can certainly hire locally as well, but you know, I am about profit on, and at home convenience and all of that stuff. So I hired my bookkeeper on Fiverr. All right, guys, that wraps it up. And again, if you found any value in here, please consider subscribing because it really helps out my channel. I do all of this content for you for free because I hope that it will help you retire early, be financially free early so that you can live the life that you were meant to live. And until next week, I'll see you then.